Welcome back home. The scripture for today's session is taken from Colossians. This is not something we often do at Pepperdine. But it does strike me um, as I was doing my own scripture reading this morning that, uh, and I have a particular app that gives me a verse for the day and then other things that what I read this morning is particularly apt in framing Ted's work and also some of our conversations that we have scheduled today. This is from Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And in that very short verse, we see the connection between identity and what we're called to do. And so much of Ted's work was really about helping us understand our identity. So much of Bruce's talk last night was remarking at Ted's work in helping us understand our identity, where it comes from, but not just to keep that contained, to lead us towards self-governance. And as we think about uh, Ted's work, and as we'll be exploring it in some depth today, that connection between freedom, identity, how our identity is formed, and what that prompts us to do, especially in America, is that connecting line for so much of Ted's work, and certainly uh, for this first panel today. As I mentioned before, we we're just talking at the table. I'm kind of the money guy for this, but the organizing person, the one that as we, we sat down to think, well, what are these panels actually going to look like? Who should we invite? I would blush to say that I made a couple contributions, but really much of that work was done by Ted's dear friend, uh, Bill McClay. Bill taught here on a couple different occasions as a uh, visiting professor, first as a Simon visiting professor um, a little over a dozen years ago, and then as our Reagan visiting professor a couple years ago. And whenever they would do events together, we came to calling them Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. <laughs> and I know that this has in some ways been called the Ted Conference. Um, but this is yet another Bill and Ted Excellent Adventure. And uh, so to uh, introduce uh, our first speaker, but also to give us an outline of what we'll be uh, doing for this morning and this afternoon, please join me in welcoming Bill McClay. Good morning. Um, I hope we'll have an excellent adventure. Um, and uh, since Pete began with scripture, I feel I have to follow suit also. So uh, you can turn in your pew Bibles to uh, Matthew 18, 20, where uh, Jesus says, whenever two or three are gathered together in his name, there he will be also. I, I don't know whether we, it, it's, it's borders on sacrilege to compare Ted thus, but uh, I do think that there's a way in which Maybe when you have 30 gathered together, <laughs> it begins to get over the threshold and we'll have a sense of his presence here, uh, his spirit with us. Um, I'm, I'm very glad to see all of you assembled. You know, this was uh, just to see you all in the flesh instead of in my mind's eye. Um, it's a little bit startling in a wonderful way. Uh, and some of you, Lee, I'm just getting acquainted with, but uh, I hope to, hope to get to know better through this. And, uh, and all, I think, and particularly this panel, have a fairly direct connection to TED. Uh, uh, so there are some exceptions, but people who uh, 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 belong in a connection with Ted, whether they know it or not, uh, are also on the on the program. What <clears throat> what we set out to do, and I'm going to I'm going to use the plural because uh, Pete was very definitely involved, and others too, in in thinking this through. 
But it's to give a sense of the range of Ted's interests and his um, uh, uh, the publications that we can still consult uh, uh, that are so pithy and uh, often appearing in very out of the way places. Although I, Law and Liberty is not an out of the way place, but uh, 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 there's a tendency uh, for periodical sort of occasional writings to disappear, and uh, that shouldn't happen to some of the things that Ted had done. He was really, <coughs> in many ways, from my point of view, the heart and soul of this place. And by this place, I don't mean Pepperdine University as a whole, which he often uh, sort of contested uh, with in a constructive way. Uh, I mean the School of Public Policy. This School of Public Policy, as you all know, is absolutely unique, precious, uh, very, very blessed to have the leadership of Pete Peterson right now, uh, who really understands. So he understands the school better than it understands itself, um, and you need that kind of leader. Uh, so, and and Pete had the the uh, close consultation, the whispering in the ear, sometimes bellowing in the ear of Ted, uh, and when Ted was around, and, and it's made an enormous impression. But Ted had a, a key role in conceptualizing what it would be like to create a school of public policy that is both uh, concerned with the sort of what I call sinks and sewers of public policy, that is the practical aspects of governance, and the, and the big philosophical issues that ought to be uh, undergirding every consideration that we bring to decisions, particularly decisions of great moment in public policy. So a philosophically grounded school of public policy. What an idea. <laughs> but um, one of the things that struck me about Ted, who was, as I'm sure we'll get, uh, he was a very independent person. And yet, in the end, he understood, and I think he came to understand, how important it is to build institutions and that we live through institutions and that you have to at some point give yourself over to not losing your integrity but to give yourself over to the making and uh, per, uh, preservation of an institution. And so the School of Public Policy earned that from him and it's the least we can do to uh, repay that. I, I'm going to, in my own remarks this afternoon, talk a little bit about the role of memory in the way Ted thought about things, so I won't do that now. But I thought each of these panels, and the speakers are people that, uh, Matthew Crawford, for example, who's presenting the next panel, I don't think that he, and you and Ted ever met, did you? Yeah, but, but he, Ted was deeply, uh, there's a real, a deep, deep commonality uh, it, it, to the extent that I remember him telling me once that, uh, you know, that Crawford says things that I, I, I've never even brought to the threshold of articulating, and he's kind of over the threshold. So uh, I wanted in every case people who were, uh, some people who disagreed with him uh, are represented here. Uh, and uh, actually, probably everybody here <laughs> disagreed with Ted if you knew him well enough uh, uh, at one time or another and, uh, and probably never persuaded him of the rectitude of your views as opposed to his. Uh, and it's an interesting basis for love, but uh, it was uh, one of the bases for love. Uh, and, and I don't hesitate to, to use that word uh, to describe the feelings not only of myself, but of many others in this room who clashed with Ted. And uh, uh, but so to to the panel, uh, Darren Stoloff, an old 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 friend of Ted's, who uh, I, uh, his graduate training was under the the noted conservative uh, scholar Eric Foner. <laughs> so that that tells you to whom you remain devoted, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. So uh, that tells you something right off the bat about. Ted, and uh, it's one of his, his longest academic friendships. So Darren was a natural person to have uh, comment on these, this article, this extended article in two parts called The Stories That We Tell. Uh, so I yield to Darren. Uh, please yield back the uh, talk. 
Oh. <laughs> I didn't think you'd know. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. Um, roughly 10 years ago, Ted McAllister delivered the two lectures that comprise the stories we tell. Ted examined the three prevalent narratives of American history. The first was a triumphalist, a triumphalist liberal celebration of the progressive unfolding of the abstract principles of individual freedom and equality. The second, a ruthless radical critique of the ubiquitous exploitation of the many by the few. Finally, the third was a conservative Jeremiad that calls the nation to come home to the ordered liberty of its founding, lest the communities that comprise it lose their liberty to centralized power in the name of, quote, democratic equality. To be sure, Ted's treatment of these meta-narratives was far more nuanced and generous than the brief uh, thumbnails I have offered. He acknowledged their professionalism of each of them, their sincerity and genuine merits. And although he preferred and practiced the conservative variant, he despaired of its success. His hope was that the liberal account, chastened and reformed by conservative critiques, might yet carry the day against the rising radical tide. Despite its virtues, Ted feared that the inculcation of the radical account in the young would find us, in his words, stranded in a very different nation and confronted with an entirely new past. This warning has proved prophetic. This combination of intellectual generosity and analytic boldness was typical of Ted. Like all his work, the stories we tell requires careful reading, reflection, and rereading. Ted's marvelous economy and directness with prose belied the breadth and subtlety of his vision. This combination was always, in person and in print, an invitation to conversation and elaboration. Indeed, confronting the stories we tell raises more questions than we could hope to address in an entire conference, much less one brief panel. How did we get here, both as a discipline and as a nation? What were the critical changes ignored or challenges unmet that has resulted in much of our youth being imbued with what Ted called the deeply divisive, quote, need for constant change and agitation? Alternately, why did Ted doubt that a conservative narrative could effectively challenge its rivals? Was it the disposition of power, whether political, academic, or disciplinary, or features inherent in the conservative narrative itself? <clears throat> And finally, what role does mythopoesis play in all consequential histories, and how is it successfully conceptualized and executed? Rather than speak to these large questions, I hope to address and expand upon Ted's suggestion that a conservative history might correct and amend the liberal narrative, and perhaps the radical as well. I think he's right to hold out this hope, but I think that there are also lessons a conservative narrative can draw from the others. And with these lessons learned, perhaps particularly from our radical colleagues, we can offer fresh and chastening warnings that might yet open minds and induce auditors to come home to the ideals of ordered liberty and the cherished mores that can still bind us as a nation. Perhaps the biggest lesson we can teach the liberal is one that Ted alluded to and actually stressed, the need to protect custom and tradition from political intrusion, especially from centralized authority. We need remind her that an individual in the best sense is a person whose self-creation comes in reaction to a given cultural milieu. In pushing against these constraints, she develops the strength and experience to develop what the transcendentalists call self-reliance the process by which she becomes her own person. But when that milieu and cultural horizon is deracinated in favor of some, quote, expressive individual, she has nothing to push against and draw on to create her own self. The result is all too often not a robust individual, but an anxious, neurotic psyche, caught in perpetual adolescent fear of being alienated from the latest trends or fads inundating her pixelated screens. This point may sound rather general or abstract, as Ted would have put it. So let me do what he would have enjoined, which is to illustrate it with a story. When I taught at City College, I would occasionally be required to teach The American Idea, a one-semester survey of American history in all its diversity. 
I would assign my students to write papers about three liberal tales of social mobility and individual accomplishment, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, and Anzia Yerzeska's autobiographical novel, The Bread Givers. In each case, it was literacy and an avid hunger for learning that broadened the subject's vision, allowing a break from the customary and social constraints that bound them. Yet in each case, that liberation ultimately required an appreciation for and reconciliation with that very cultural milieu. Since most of you are likely to know the Franklin and Douglas texts, allow me to illustrate with Yerzerskis. The protagonist is the younger, youngest daughter of an unemployed rabbi on the Lower East Side of Manhattan who tyrannizes over them. He makes monumentally disastrous choices for them while demanding they support him as he spends his days studying the Torah. Only young Sarah has the gumption to defy her father. He calls her blood and iron for her Bismarckian strength of will. At a very young age, she strikes out on her own. Through dint of hard work and sacrifice, she breaks from her, uh, she breaks from her family, community, and faith. She works her way into and through college and becomes a public school teacher in her old neighborhood. She is now a professional woman, strong and independent, the very exemplar of this self made an acculturated American individual. She even becomes engaged to the proverbial nice Jewish guy, another self-made and assimilated individual who just happens to be the principal at her school. And then, as the novel comes towards its end, she stumbles upon her father peddling sticks of chewing gum in the street, threadbare, filthy, and ill. When her betrothed insists that they bring him home to live with them and teach them Hebrew and the mysteries of the scriptures, he has an almost anthropological fascination with the topic. Sour objects to his dictatorial rigidity, one that would require that they adopt his customs, including keeping a kosher home and observing orthodox rituals. The book ends when he brings Sarah the final lesson in her quest for self-creation. Her father's patriarchal and religious dogmatism were part and parcel of the culture that formed him. And that same culture, through his influence, formed her as well. Where, after all, had she acquired the thirst for knowledge and accomplishment and the blood and iron will that allowed her to achieve them, but from her domineering rabbinical father. She was uniquely among her sisters, her father's daughter. Her recognition of this truth and her acceptance of her father and his traditions, albeit voluntarily and on her terms, represents the completion of her self-creation as a self-reliant individual. She had, as Ted would say, come home. One conservative lesson we might teach our radical interlocutors is the centrality of the local and customary for the creation of vibrant social movements. This is certainly the case in Lawrence Goodwin's celebrated history of the populist movement, Democratic Promise. Born of shared mores and experiences, the collective agency of the Farmers Alliance bred a, quote, movement culture among many Southern sharecroppers, both black and white. But when populism went national and political, it lost its vibrancy as a grassroots movement and fell under the sway of agitators and brokers only tangentially connected with the impulses of the farmers. When it ultimately fused with the Democratic Party in promoting the presidential candidacy of William Jennings Bryan, it had devolved to a protest against the gold standard and a series of targeted agricultural support programs that, as our radical historians insist, ultimately uh, enacted in an ultimately resulted in an attenuated form the, uh, to serve the interests of the most successful units and ignored the plight of those most in need. A similar trajectory can be plotted in many radical histories of organized labor as the solidarity and militancy born of shared experiences and communities at the local and industrial level gave way to larger units whose professional business leadership became increasingly divorced from the experiences and aspirations of local members. This process reached its culmination with the imbrication of big labor in national politics that has left national leadership so divorced from the experiences of their members that, as several recent cases suggest, they are not above peculation at their expense. In both cases, the lesson for the radical is that grassroots participatory movements thrive in communities rooted in shared experiences and mores, but lose their, quote, democratic promise when they grow too large or turn to national politics. 
One is also tempted to add the worldly observation of the longshoreman come philosopher, Eric Hoffer. Every great cause begins as a movement, becomes a business, and eventually degenerates into a racket. And what can we learn from our liberal and radical brethren? From the liberal, we can learn that not all changes are bad, and that not all expansions of, expansions of federal authority demand Jeremiads. For all its flaws, the progressive movement was not wrong to exert federal administrative power in the regulation of nationally marketed food and drugs, nor did all progressive reforms entail an expansion of federal power. The creation of administrative structures like the Galveston Commission government in 19. 01 to oversee the rebuilding of that community after its virtual destruction by hurricane the previous year was a joint venture by the city and state. Similarly, the incorporation of the Jersey City Water Works in 1908, the first government sewage and chlorination treatment of its kind in the nation, was an entirely municipal affair. In fact, some progressive efforts took the form of entirely private civil society institutions like the celebrated settlement houses. This is not to suggest that progressivism didn't have its dark side, but there were enough sensible and even beneficial elements that it remains possible to be charitable towards some impulses and save our ire for the egregious. In a sense, the liberal can teach us uh, something about the tonality of our portrait, that the dark needs to be contrasted with the light. Even after what I will briefly claim was a very dangerous brush with the dark side of progressivism during the First World War and its immediate aftermath, one can and perhaps should maintain with Bill McClay that America was still the land of hope. Finally, the lesson that we can learn from radical historiography is perhaps the most difficult and important of all, namely the willingness to occasionally ruthlessly critique our past and some of its central figures, movements, and institutions. This so-called speaking truth to power is instinctually anathema to those who, on sensible conservative grounds, obey the injunction against the uncovering of the nakedness of fathers. Precisely because it can all too easily breed what Ted warned of, a distrust of those in authority. But without recourse to this resource, we are forced, as Ted acknowledged, to quote, defend ways of living and moral habits that are impossible to defend well. To be sure, a conservative history must understand such ways of life and their mores with as much internal consistency and charity as possible. Indeed, that is a basic requirement for all serious historical inquiry. But I'm not sure they always need to be defended. For a conservative narrative to successfully correct, much less challenge, the primacy of radical and liberal variants, it must choose its ground carefully, deciding what is and isn't worth conserving. To be freed from the need to defend every inch of our past liberates us to point out to our competitors their own false consciousness and self-contradiction. We can confront our radical champions of majoritarian democracy with the fact that white supremacist dogmas that marred much of our public life in the 19th and early 20th centuries was not some alien force imposed by distance elites and institutions, but a small d democratic affair that was promulgated in our politics by a large D Democratic Party whose propensity, in Ted's phrase, to put people, pit people against one another, group against group, class against class, by means of identity politics, has been a feature from its founding to the present. Similarly, we can force our liberal friends to see that the dom domestic political price we paid for the progressive intrusion of the principles of the Declaration of Independence into foreign affairs during World War I was the erection of a regime of massive propaganda, harassment, and often brutal repression that is hard not to see as a precursor to Italian fascism. Nor should we fail to point out that many of those very progressives, as Ira Katz Nelson has reminded us recently in Fear Itself, would admire fascism as a fellow progressive movement from its inception in the 1920s right through their service in FDR's pre-war administration. In closing, I hope that Ted would have liked and agreed with some of my suggestions. No doubt others would have raised question and the need for explanation. Perhaps some he would have objected to thoughtfully but forcefully. Yet in any case, the result would have been literally hours of intense and edifying conversation. We are all richer 
for having had some of those conversations. What a beautiful idea for a conference. Um, you can tell uh, by my very appearance the influence that Ted had on me. I've grown a stubble and uh, have jettisoned my tie. Uh, if I had ever encountered Ted in a three-piece suit, I would have been deeply disappointed, uh, just as I would be very annoyed if I ever encountered my Princeton colleague, Robbie George, in anything but a three-piece suit. <laughs> Uh, allow me to begin my tribute to Ted by thanking Pete Peterson and Bill McClay, the avuncular Bill, for inviting me here. Ted was a visiting fellow in residence in Robbie George's in my program at Princeton back in academic year 2012-2013. He, he uh, commuted in every day from his family's rented home in Hopewell, working on a book on the liberal journalist Walter Lippmann's thought. I'm morally certain that there's an unfinished manuscript on Lippmann in Ted's archives, along with his many other works in progress. We remained in regular touch after Ted left, and over the 10 years that followed, my admiration and affection for him only grew. Darren's remarks brought home to me, once again, the intellectual virtues Ted and Darren shared as intellectual historians. Learned, eloquent, analytically sophisticated, and sometimes wise. I am not uh, a, an historian of progressivism or of anything else except my family tree. Um, but I was happy to see Darren make the point about Lawrence Goodwin's study, namely that the populist movement was indeed initially based in allegiance to local and religious customs and traditions, and that it deteriorated as it became a national movement summed up in and reduced to the free silver cause. And I loved his recovery of Eric Hoffer's immortal words, quote, every great cause begins as a movement, becomes a business, and eventually degenerates into a racket, end quote. We need only to consider the origins of the civil rights movement brilliantly expressed from a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama, morphing into the DEI industry that none can escape, and then the racket. I'll just say the name Al Sharpton. Enough said. Localism can be both populist and conservative. Darren's point about the racism of the Southern expression of local community is of course well taken. But the remedy for that was the fact that the South was, was uh, embedded in, after some disputation, a larger federal framework devoted to the pr promotion and protection of individual rights. Uh, as Christopher Caldwell has argued, the problem localists face today is that the civil rights paradigm has been applied without nuance to any and all national versus local discrepancies. And so it's not legitimate, indeed it's immoral, certainly indecent for a state to come to the conclusion that abortion is not an absolute right, or that marriage is founded in sexual difference, or that a man cannot, or at least he ought not, become a woman, and vice versa. Darren is describing here the healthy tension between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The latter ensured that local traditions would always be available to push back on the former's regime of national rights, while the former's regime of rights helpfully eroded oppressive local communities. It's when progressivism enters the picture that the tension disappears in favor of a national communitarian regime. And that's when it's good for conservatives to become serious critics of the establishment. Because the establishment is itself an unhealthy attempt to resolve the federalist, anti-federalist tension through overweening national institutions. It has no sense of, no humility regarding the limits of what it can understand and thus control. It strikes me that if the national government stuck to protecting rights as originally understood, 
It could counter racism, but avoid the dangers of identity politics because it would not be attempting to impose its winner-take-all idea of community, which, in a free society, is always doomed to fail. See Federalist Number 10. You can't create a community based on intractable differences. Localism and federalism mean you don't have to try. Thank you. Um, I owe a lot to Ted. Um, some things I think I'm still just discovering. But perhaps the funniest is that I didn't know I was conservative until I started to talk to him. Um, and then I started asking some of my friends, and they said, yeah, didn't you know? And I was, I was like, no, no one told me. Um, and I think the, the reason for that is that there are so few opportunities to actually articulate this understanding in different areas of our education. So I did my undergraduate at UC Berkeley, and I felt fully part of that community in so many different ways. And also, I think, also became blind to some of the things that I already brought to it. So both my, um, my culture, as well as eventually my, my faith as well. And these were things that I hadn't quite come to philosophically understand. And um, we've heard a lot about Ted's publications, but I think in some ways the most important are the things that he didn't publish, those one-to-one -one emails where you, you could be inundated by a thousand words on a Monday morning and you're not entirely sure what happened, but you're in this conversation about the most important things. Um, we heard today about how SPP is the, um, how Ted was the heart and soul of SPP. Um, I'd like to take that a step further and make the argument that the School of Public Policy, especially um, with Ted's influence, actually serves the very role that Darren was talking about earlier, which is the way in which the conservative tradition can speak to the larger liberal one, the, the larger liberal narrative how you take the optimistic element and um, as the primary narrative because it's the one that helps us move forward, but also how the conservative one creates the ballast for that, the humility, and also the knowledge that it takes to move forward in ways that are actually productive. Um, so I have in front of me, and I'm just going to read a paragraph from it. There's more, of course. Um, but an email that Ted forwarded to me that he wrote to a former provost at Pepperdine. Uh, this was not something that was ever published, he, he said. Um, uh, on sort of the nitty gritty administrative level, there's a council here at Pepperdine called University Faculty Council. And I think Mark knows the history a little bit more than me, but Ted sat on this for many, many years. It was, it was an advisory council. It wasn't... Um, um, actually in charge of anything, but what it did was it provided opportunities for faculty across all of the schools to speak to uh, upper administration and each other about key issues that were important to Pepperdine. Um, and um, in that contrast, that back and forth, the way in which um, uh, Pepperdine has moved forward over the years. Ted was a key player in that. So I wanted to read the paragraph. So this, the larger email, and I don't have the title of it, but I, I called it tradition. So how, how, how um, Ted defined tradition and tried to teach those who were responsible for caring for Pepperdine's tradition about what that would mean in a practical context. Um, so here's his uh, definition. Tradition is the primary means by which a people incorporates changes that keep faith with the great cloud of witnesses who have carried the torch of faith before us. <coughs> Tradition is a means of healthy change, in part because it incorporates. The individual is not an isolated atom living briefly and then dying with no greater purpose beyond those he designs for his brief span. 
As part of historical traditions, he seeks to preserve what is best about what he has been handed. His patrimony seeks to alter those parts that don't fit circumstances. And he seeks to improve the parts that are inadequate or improper. By being faithful to this process, by incorporating piety and respect for what has come before him, the faithful member of a living tradition casts his eyes on those who are not yet born because he bears a responsibility of handing down, improved, what he has been given. Tradition helps place the brief moment of one's life into a story that extends both directions in time. Unlike the flies of summer who know not their ancestors or descendants, people who belong to a tradition know who they are and they have an understanding of the story to which they belong. So um, most of what I know about history, I learned um, talking to Ted. I'm an economist, so I know very little about history. So uh, I'm responding to Ted's essay, but I think I have something to say to Darren's excellent comments as well. Um, so in reading the stories we tell, um, Ted starts out with you know, that, that history is a story. It, it guides us. It shapes our vision about what's important, what our goals uh, should be as individuals and as a people. Um, but early on, he, he makes two intriguing claims that, that um, uh, are, are quite striking, um, to, to me at least. Uh, first, he starts out, Ted claims that there are many competing narratives, not surprising, but he claims that they're all true in, in parentheses. Uh, each is rooted in evidence, in professional historical practice. Um, and at the same time, he says we have an obligation to craft what he calls the best story. Uh, so that leaves me thinking, well, how do you find that? How do you find the best story? If, there, if all these narratives are true, then in one sense all are untrue, right? unless one of them encompasses all of the others. The second intriguing thing he says early on in the essay is he quotes Thomas Mann, and he says, one can easily be in a story and not understand it. So uh, I, that immediately got me thinking and said, well, we're, we are all in a story, whether you believe it's told by God or, or not, we're all in a story that we cannot fully understand. We cannot fully understand. Our understanding is trapped within what Aquinas called a double darkness, um, sin and ignorance, or our own finitude. So that means liberal, liberal stories, radical histories might be true, but they are necessarily partial. Um, true up to a point. And to the extent that they don't acknowledge their limits, what they must leave out, uh, they can become false and even harmful. So how do you make history, I ask, in light of its place in cultural and personal formation and its essential incompleteness? I believe this is what Ted called conservative history. Uh, there's a substance to it, of course, but there's also this awareness that you begin with. The conservative story is about contextualized goods. There are no unencumbered individuals, no ahistorical models or systems that work themselves out behind the appearances. Society is unimaginably complex. It's a network of contingency that only yields reluctantly to simplification and pure abstract narratives. These narratives offer valuable but always partial insights. And reality tends to punish those who lose sight of the necessary limits of any simplified history. <coughs> when a narrative, in my discipline we call the models, claims to be comprehensive or the magic key to unlock all social mysteries, it can cause untold damage. The damage is most often suffered by people who had no part in promoting or applying the social vision. Since both liberal and radical theories are abstract and untethered from the contingency and the complexity of the world, both are subject to this conservative critique. So what does this conservative story have to offer? 
Fundamentally, it's a caution against hubris, a reminder that history is largely a history of failure, that no success is unalloyed, and that the good is difficult to maintain and, a and attain. So how should we see history in light of this caution? One, any history is, is, will be less dangerous when, it's see, when it is seen and recognizes that it's necessarily incomplete. The damage often comes when you don't recognize this. There should be a reflexive suspicion of grand visions, of ideals without any practical embodiment or, or correction. And a preference for adaptation and reform. Uh, a reluctance to reject re arrangements which have survived whose function and goodness we can never fully understand until they're gone. Now in this essay, Ted doesn't emphasize complexity and contingency necessarily, directly, but he had a deep respect for their place in society and in history. His fierce resistance to any generalization sprang from his commitment to complexity and contingency. I think this complexity and the recognition of it is another explanation for what Darren calls the weakness of the conservative uh, narrative. Any history which resists easy generalization and abstraction is of necessity difficult to systematize. And in modernity, we abstract and systematize everything. It's on, uh, we, can't, we don't think we can understand unless we've abstracted and systematized. The conservative historian needs virtues beyond the passionate commitment of the radical to equality and justice, or the similar commitment of the liberal to progressive liberation uh, from constraint. He needs humility for embracing all of the data of telling the story of constitutional success, of degrading oppression, of instability amid apparent social and national solidity. Complicated stories are not popular among historians and they're not popular in politics. Perhaps conservative history can serve better as a mode of inquiry. This isn't sort of the substance of it, but does it offer a mode of inquiry to these other histories? Something which can complement and correct the others. I think Darren starts on, on this path and, and speculates about it. Can one be a liberal historian in the conservative mode? I think many attempt to be. The question is whether one can be a radical historian in a conservative mode, focusing on the drama of the oppressor and the oppressed throughout history and at the same time resisting the urge to promote this drama to the status of a comprehensive vision of all social reality. Thank you. Darren, do you want to respond to anybody, or uh, no. anybody want to respond to anybody else? Because I, I want to open the conversation. Yes, well, let's open the conversation. Anybody who has questions, comments, please don't throw anything. Uh, or if you do, direct it at me. I, I, <laughs> Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, kind of looking at just um, practical means here, it seems that the progressives and the liberals are very good at telling stories, particularly in Hollywood and other places, and have kind of captured that narrative. How can conservatives do a better job of telling these stories? Uh, you know, as you mentioned, it's conservative history, seeing it through that lens and making it more popular and appealing to people because it just seems we're losing the battle on that front. Uh, excellent question. Um, m many, many factors. Um, uh, and I mentioned that before, why did Ted despair of the conservative narrative? I think Andy's right. Part of it also was that the complexity makes it, mm -hmm. you know, we all do this. We read a, a great book and then see the Hollywood movie of it. And it's like, well, that was fun, but that's not, it wasn't a book. It has to be. The, the medium does that. Um, but part of it also is, is, as I mentioned, questions of power, um, both academic, um, disciplinary. Um, you know, there is a birds of a feather flock together. And I think sometimes that conservative narratives can be so powerful that they need to be silenced, that they just need to not be published. And I do, I do think that is a factor. It's not easy to get 
get it out there. Um, so, but what can we do? Well, I mean, I've suggested one thing, which is, um, or, or let, me, let me suggest one thing, which is embrace the complexity. Tell a complex and difficult story. Um, and I think you have to cultivate a taste for it, but it is entirely possible to tell or even make a movie or a TV show about the past where no one is a clear hero and no one is a clear villain. I mean, there are more villainous people and more heroic fi figures, uh, and where things don't always work out perfectly, but we muddle through. Um, that's not as uh, inspiring, but it is satisfying. I mean, you, you, and you mentioned before the, the uh, desire we have for models and narratives. Um, and, and I think part of that is um, both the, the, the radical I would say that the liberal narr narrative is heroic. The radical na narrative is, and I want to jump on a future panel, so I'll leave it, is more or less Gnostic. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the secret hidden truth, and it must be imposed on the universe. Mm -hmm. um, I think the conservative narrative attempts to be wise. So it will not have a universal message. It'll have about 50 messages. And wisdom is knowing when to deploy one rather than the other. Um, so you need to create a taste for that. You need to show how that had a, uh, um, a positive impact. One example would be to, to, to do a movie about Abraham Lincoln and say he didn't evolve so much as realize circumstances have changed. And now it's appropriate to do this as opposed to then. And you have to be responsive because, you know, as Walt Whitman said, we contain multitudes. Which multitude to use at any given moment? I'd say those would probably be the most useful things we could do. Um, but I mean, what it requires people doing is saying, transfer the love you have for a particular vision or a particular model to the context in which you grew, right? I mean, you got to sort of be Sarah Smolinsky and say, you know, I'm, I'm not going back to the shtetl. I'm not doing it. But this is where I'm from. And this, this is my home. If I lose home, I can't come home. So I don't, I don't know if you guys want to add to that. I think, um, I think the more people know their own stories, their own family stories, the better off everyone will be. So I think a very practical question would be, can your child tell your story? If they can, that's pretty good. Can your child tell their grandparents' stories. I think that's actually very hard in today's society, how well they understand the lives from the point of view of their grandparents. Now, I start on the personal level because I actually think the abstraction, th there are, um, and this is not something Ted argued, but something that I think um, I've come to understand is that there are overlaps in some of the methodologies between even the ra very radical yeah. and the conservative. And that has to do with the importance of um, personal narrative. So when we talk about something like the importance of local, uh, local tradition or family, this is only made possible by understanding those things. Now, what we've seen in universities is functionally the gutting of any sort of historical thinking or training at all. In response, I think the only way forward is one that is slightly self-interested, but also very deeply meaningful, which is the account of what it is that someone's own family went through. Because it, if you can move from, say, being angry at your parents or being angry at your grandparents for not doing things X, Y, and Z way, to understanding that they too were bound by these contingencies of their lives, right? If there's that moment of sympathy, of, um, of love that comes from not just the love of a child, but also the love of, of wisdom, of understanding of what it means from that perspective, I think you'll have something more there. Now, whether or not you can turn that into some like media campaign or a movie, whatever, I think that's harder. But families can start.
by asking whether or not they're doing the things in a conscientious way to share the histories and then, frankly, to put them down in writing. Because without that element, you lose the, the cultural and familial history over time because it starts to become flattened. Um, and I think that's really problematic. Yeah, I, I, in, in reading Ted's essays, I was immediately, he starts out with the story of, uh, uh, one of the stories of the Hebrews uh, and the desire to go home. And uh, I was immediate, and, and contrasted that to the rise of philosophy and its desire to know the nature of things. And uh, it, it immediately, and, and I'm sure it would resonate with some of you, immediately reminded me of a lecture given in 1952 by Leo Strauss uh, called Progress or Return, Our Contemporary Crisis, where he is doing the same kind of uh, comparing and contrasting a traditional point of view that doesn't depend on abstraction and conceptualization, but rather on historical experience uh, and the experience of the divine, and a philosophic point of view, which is the life of inquiry with a view to understanding, uh, not living within, but sort of looking at uh, life and the world from somewhat from without. and and. Uh, I think I would just recommend that essay or that lecture to you in order to put it in conversation with Ted. Um, I think Ted's much more optimistic about the ability to harmonize these two ways of being uh, than perhaps Strauss was. He saw it as a radical difference that is indeed the fount of the greatness of Western civilization, but I think uh, he was a little more pessimistic about the turn in philosophy that happened in the Enlightenment and afterwards, and its, its, its love of <coughs> pushing abstract ideas to the point of revolution uh, and, and leading to terrible disorders. So. I, I just want to put in my two cents, if I may, uh, that, that uh, William Dean Howells, the great, although unrecognized, American novelist uh, of the 19th century, said, what Americans want is a tragedy with a happy, happy ending. <laughs> and, I, you know, I think someone like Sam Goldwyn or one of the, the, the titans of the studio system in Hollywood would have said the same thing. And... Uh, that's that's a problem uh, when we come to the kind of question you know, you know the, we to uh, to have a, a, a the, the tragic sense of life um, as part of popular culture is uh, just not something that that people want to hear and and uh, to go to the three stories model this is something that the liberal story and the radical story don't really do a very good job with i would be especially critical of the radical tradition in this respect that could have could have been more of a uh, a vehicle for expressing the tragic sense of life someone like william appleman williams for example i think maybe is one who does that but he's almost a conservative rather than a radical. I don't want to get into the weeds of historiography, but... Uh, Eugene but, Genovese. Really. Yeah, Eugene Genovese, yeah, yeah. very definitely. Uh, um, so, and, and this was someone that Ted, Ted admired, of course, as we all do. Uh, but, uh, uh, so I think that that's, that's another, another element here. I was also thinking, you know, you're talking about uh, the past and you're talking about immigration. Uh, Marcus Lee Hansen, you know, I go in for the old historians. <laughs> well, he was the great historian of immigration before Oscar Handlin and, uh, and, and then his successors. Um, but he had a saying that uh, I, I think is absolutely unforgettable. The son wishes to remember what the father wishes to forget. And what it gets at is the poignancy of immigration. There's a great tragedy in immigration, even when it's successful as we celebrate it, uh, because there's a loss. Um, and there's a loss, you think of uh, 
and this has been portrayed in fiction. Uh, the, 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 the experience of, the, of the, the grandparents who come into a world where they don't ever learn the language, where they never learn the folkways, where they watch their children and their children's children drift off into a culture that might as well be on the dark side of the moon for them. Um, that's an enormous wrenching thing that is repeated again and again and again in this most celebrated aspect of our history. Um, we don't really want to hear about it. Uh, <laughs> we, and uh, the stories of all kinds of displacements. For example, I have a particular interest in the fate of the families who were thrown off their land to create Shenandoah National Park. Um, I, I, I taught in East Tennessee for a while, and there's a similar story about the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And, uh, you know, we don't, this is, these people... <laughs> I, I had students who were descended from some of those families, and I heard about it from them. But outside of those families, this is, these are stories that are not told. And uh, how can you uh, incorporate that into a, a, a narrative that's ultimately, as it, I think, must be, affirmative of the national project. And you know, Ted had an aversion to the word project. He said at one point, he said, thank God America is not a project. <laughs> and uh, that was what fit into Bruce's comments of last night. But uh, do we have other questions? Yes, Sharon. Hi, uh, my name is Sharon Kadar. I'm a personal friend, and I'm definitely an outsider professionally here. Uh, but I'm really spent a lot of weekends together um, and I originally wasn't going to be here this morning but I think Ted would have appreciated I skipping synagogue and had a slice of bacon in his honor uh, but, but, I, but I have a question about um, storytelling and narrative so I come from the aerospace area and speci specifically mission formulation where we put together big proposals, mainly to NASA, our sponsor, hundreds of millions, billion dollars. And we have adopted a lot of the narrative from Hollywood. They love the practices from Hollywood. Uh, storyboarding, uh, elevator pitch. And I want to get to the elevator pitch. Um, it's important for any story that you try to tell, and especially if you try to sell it, to be able to distill the complexity into a sharp, crisp elevators, elevator pitch that has a solid foundation. And I think that conservatives really suck at it. <laughs> and in the, in the, definitely in this day and age, if the choice is between a crisp and vacuous elevator pitch, which we hear a lot of, and a complex story that has a very solid foundation, unfortunately, the former wins. Mm. So what can we do to tell a better, crisper elevator pitch? Mm -hmm. Wow. That, that's it. That's, that's and a, make it fast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Seven elevator pitch. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, that, that, that's a great question um, and, and a, a real big problem. Um, so, I mean, part of, our, part of the reason that we need elevator pitches, and I, I want to return to something that Bruce was talking about yesterday and why we can't speak to Bill's tragedies and still be on the whole positive, is because generations of pixelated immersion, both television, Hollywood, have produced um, uh, an intellectual response in most people that are not deeply immersed in high culture that is essentially adolescent. We're incapable of having that adult understanding that our grandparents had about, my life's going to be tough. It's, it's over, but it goes on. So it was a success, failure for me, success for you, or loss for me and success for you. But I think you're still right. If we're going to hold on, we have to have um, a story. So I would say that the if I need two words for the elevator pitch for the conservative story, true grit. <laughs> Life's going to hurt. 
It's not, we're not going to solve the problems. We may massage them. We may make them a little bit. We're not going to get a utopia. You're not going to be all happy all the time. You're not going to continue to look like you were and feel like you were at 25 when you're 70. Hey. True grit. Well, you, certain cases accepted. <laughs> Well, we have to stop there, unfortunately. Thank you all very much for wonderful comments. Thank all of you.